This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Tenth day, May the twenty fourth, part two. The Attorney General's reply. The Attorney General, at ten minutes before three, commenced his reply, speaking occasionally in so low a tone that the conclusion of many of his sentences was inaudible he said may it please your lordships and gentlemen of the jury the case for the prosecution and the case for the defence are now before you and it now becomes my duty to address to you such observations upon the whole of the evidence as suggest themselves to my mind i feel that i have a moral solemn and important duty to perform i wish i could have answered the appeal made to me the other day by my learned friend sergeant she and say that i am satisfied with the case which he submitted to you for the defence but standing here as the instrument of public justice i feel that i should be wanting in the duty that i have to perform if i did not ask at your hands for a verdict of guilty against the prisoner i approach the consideration of the case in i hope what i may term a spirit of fairness and moderation my business is to convince you if i can by facts and legitimate arguments of the prisoner's guilt and if i cannot establish it to your satisfaction no man will rejoice more than i shall in a verdict of acquittal gentlemen in the mass of evidence which has been brought before you two main questions present themselves prominently for your consideration did the deceased man whose death we are now inquiring die a natural death or was he taken off by the foul means of poison and if the latter proposition be sanctioned by the evidence then comes the important if possible the still more important question whether the prisoner at the bar was the author of the death i will proceed with the consideration of the subject in the order which i have mentioned did john parsons cook die by poison i assert and contend the affirmative of that proposition the case which is submitted to you on behalf of the crown is this that having been first practised upon by antimony cook was at last killed by strychnine the first question to be considered is what was the immediate and proximate cause of his death the witnesses for the prosecution have told you one and all that in their judgment he died of tetanus which signifies a convulsive spasmodic action of the muscles of the body can there be any doubt that their opinion is correct of course it does not follow that because he died of tetanus it must be the tetanus of strychnia that is a matter for after consideration but inasmuch as strychnine produces death by tetanus we must see in the first place whether it admits of doubt that he did die of tetanus i have listened with great attention to every form in which that disease has been brought under your consideration whether by the positive evidence of witnesses or whether by reference to the works of scientific writers and i assert deliberately that no case either in the human subject or in the animal has been brought under your notice in which the symptoms of tetanus have been so marked as in this case from the moment the paroxysms came on of which the unhappy man died the symptoms were of the most marked and of the most striking character every muscle of his body was convulsed he expressed the most intense dread of suffocation he entreats them to lift him up lest he should be suffocated and every muscle in his body from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet was so stricken the flexibility of the trunk and the limbs was gone and you could only have raised him up as you would have raised a corpse in order that he might escape from the dread of suffocation they turned him over and then in the midst of that fearful paroxysm one mighty spasm seemed to have seized his heart to have pressed from it the life-blood and the result was death and when he died his body exhibited the most marked symptoms of this fearful disease he was convulsed from head to foot you could have rested him on his head and heels his hands were clasped with the grasp that it required force to overcome and his feet assumed an arched appearance then if it was a case of tetanus into which fact i will not waste your time by inquiry the question arises was it a case of tetanus produced by strychnia i will confine myself for a moment to the exhibition of the symptoms as described by the witnesses 
tetanus may proceed from natural causes as well as from the administration of poisons and while the symptoms last they are the same but in the course of the symptoms and before the disease reaches its consummation in the death of the patient the distinction between the two is marked by characteristics which enable any one conversant with the subject to distinguish between them we have been told on the highest authority that the distinctions are these natural tetanus is a disease not of minutes not of hours but of days it takes say several other witnesses from three to four days and will extend to a period of even three weeks before the patient dies upon that point we have the most abundant and conclusive evidence of dr curling we have the evidence of dr brodie we have the evidence of dr daniel a gentleman who have seen something like twenty-five or thirty cases we have the evidence of a gentleman who has practised twenty-five years in india where these cases arising from cold are infinitely more frequent and he gives exactly the same description of the course which this disease invariably takes idiopathic or traumatic tetanus is therefore out of the question upon the evidence which has been given but traumatic tetanus is out of the question for a very different reason traumatic tetanus is brought on by the lesion of some part of the body but what is there in this case to show that there was anything like lesion at all we have had several gentlemen called who have come here with an evident determination to misconceive and misrepresent every fact we have called before you an eminent physician who had cook under his care it seems that in the spring of the year eighteen fifty five cook having found certain small spots manifest themselves in one or two parts of his body and having something of an ulcerated tongue and a sore throat conceived that he was labouring under symptoms of a particular character he addressed himself to dr savage who found that the course of medicine he had been pursuing was an erroneous one he enjoined the discontinuance of mercury his injunction was obeyed and the result was that the patient was suffering neither from disease nor wrong treatment but lest there should be any possibility of mistake dr savage says that long before the summer advanced every unsatisfactory symptom had entirely gone there was nothing wrong about him except that affection of the throat to which thousands of people are subject in other respects the man was better than he had been and might be said to be convalescent on the very day that he leaves london to go into the country a fortnight before the races his stepfather who accompanied him to the station congratulated him upon his healthy and vigorous appearance and the young man conscious of a restored state of health struck his breast and said he was well very well then he goes to shrewsbury and shortly afterwards arose those matters to which i am about to call your attention i want to know in what part of the evidence there is the slightest pretence for saying that this man had an affection which might bring on traumatic tetanus it is said that he has exhibited his tongue to witnesses and applied for a mercurial wash but it is clear that although he had at one time adopted that course he had under the recommendation of dr savage got rid of it and there is no pretence for saying he was suffering under any syphilitic affection of any kind that fact has been negatived by a man of the highest authority and eminence it is a pretence for which there was not a shadow of a foundation and i should shrink from my duty if i did not denounce it as a pretence unworthy of your attention there is nothing about the man which would warrant for a single moment the supposition that there was anything of that character in any part of his body when the tetanus set in one or two cases of traumatic tetanus have been adduced in the evidence which has been brought forward for the defence one is the case of a man in the london hospital who was brought into that institution one evening and died the same night but what are the facts the facts are that before he had been brought in he had a paroxysm early in the morning that he was suffering from ulcers of the most aggravated description the symptoms had run their course rapidly it is true but the case was not one of minutes but of hours another case has been brought forward in which the toe was amputated but there we have disease existing some time before death but then it is suggested that this may be a case of idiopathic tetanus proceeding from what 
they say that cook was a man of delicate constitution subject to excitement that he had something the matter with his chest that in addition to having something the matter with his chest he had the diseased condition of throat and putting all these things together they say that if the man took cold he might get idiopathic tetanus we are here launched into a sea of speculations and possibilities dr nunnally who comes here for the purpose of inducing you to believe there was something like idiopathic tetanus goes through supposed infirmities and talks about his excitability his delicacy of chest his affection of the throat and he says these things were predisposed to idiopathic tetanus if he took colds but what evidence is there that he did take cold not the slightest in the world there is not the smallest pretence that he ever complained of a cold or was treated for a cold i cannot help saying that it seemed to me that it is a scandal upon a learned and distinguished and liberal profession that men should come forward to put forth such speculations upon these perverted facts and draw from them sophistical and unwarrantable conclusions with a view to deceive you i have the greatest respect for science no man can have more but i cannot repress my indignation and abhorrence when i see it perverted and prostituted for the purposes of a particular case in a court of justice dr nunnally talked to you about certain excitements being the occasion of idiopathic tetanus you remember the sorts of excitement of which he spoke they are unworthy of your notice they were topics discreditable to be put forward by a witness as worthy of your consideration but suppose for a single moment that excitement at the time could produce any such effect where is the excitement manifested by cook as leading to the supposed disease they say that the man when he won his money at shrewsbury was for a moment excited and well he might be his fortunes depended upon the result of the race and i will not deny that he was overpowered with emotions of joy but those emotions subsided and we have no further trace of them from that time to the moment of his death the man passed the rest of the day with his friends in ordinary conversation and enjoyment no trace of emotion was found he is taken ill he goes to rugeley he is taken ill there again but is there the slightest symptom of excitement about him or of depression not the least when he is ill like most people he is low-spirited as soon as he gets a little better he is cheerful and happy he invites his friends and converses with them on the night of his death his conversation is cheerful he is mirthful and happy little thinking poor fellow of the fate that was depending over him he is cheerful and talks of the future but not in language of excitement what pretence is there for this idle story about excitement none whatever but even if there were excitement or depression if these things were capable of producing idiopathic tetanus the character of the disease is so essentially different that it is impossible to mistake the two what are the cases which they attempt to set up against us they brought forward a mary watson who with a gentleman came all the way from some place in scotland to tell us that a girl had been ill all day that she is taken worse at night that she gets well in a short time and goes about her business that is a case which they brought here to be compared with the death agony of this man these are the sort of cases with which they attempt to meet such a case as is spoken to here gentlemen i venture upon the evidence which has been brought before you to assert boldly that the cases of idiopathic and traumatic tetanus are marked by clear and distinct characteristics distinguishing them from the tetanus of strychnine and i say that the tetanus which accompanied cook's death is not referable to either of these forms of tetanus you have upon this point the evidence of men of the highest competency and most unquestionable integrity and upon their evidence i am satisfied you can come to no other conclusion than that this was not a case of either idiopathic or traumatic tetanus but then various attempts have been made to set up different causes as capable of producing this tetanic disease and first we have the theory of general convulsions and dr nunnally having gone through the bead-roll of the supposed infirmities of cook says 
oh this may have been a case of general convulsions i have known general convulsions assuming a tetanic character i said to him have you ever seen one single case in which death arising from general convulsions accompanied with tetanic symptoms has not ended in the unconsciousness of the patient he says no i have never heard of such a case not one but in some book or other i am told there is some such case reported and he cites for that purpose as an authority for general convulsions being accompanied with tetanic symptoms dr copland now dr copland i apprehend would stand higher as an authority than the man who quotes him dr copland might have been called but was not called notwithstanding the challenge which i threw out because it is unfortunately easier for the case to gather together from the east and from the west pr practitioners of more or less celebrity than to bring to bear on the subject the light of science as treasured in the books of the eminent practitioners whom you have seen but i say as regards general convulsions the distinction is plain if they destroy the patient they destroy consciousness but here unquestionably at the very last moment until cook's heart ceased to beat his consciousness remained but then comes another supposed condition from which death in this form is said to have resulted and that is the cause intended to be set up by a very eminent practitioner dr partridge it seems that in the post-mortem examination of cook when the spinal marrow was investigated some granules were found and it is said that these may have occasioned tetanic convulsions similar to those found in cook he is called to prove that this was a case of what is called arachnitis arising from granules i asked him the symptoms which he would find in such a case i called his attention to what it had evidently not been called before namely the symptoms in cook's case and i asked him in simple terms whether looking at these symptoms he would pledge his reputation in the face of the medical world and in the face of this court that this was a case of arachnitis he would not do so and the case of arachnitis went then we have a gentleman who comes all the way from scotland to inform us as the next proposition that cook's was a case of epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications well i asked him the question did you ever know of epilepsy with or without tetanic complications in which consciousness was not destroyed before the patient died his reply was no i cannot say that i ever did but i have read in some book that such a case has occurred is there anything to make you think this was epilepsy it may have been epilepsy because i don't know what else it is but you must admit that epilepsy is characterized generally by loss of consciousness what difference would the tetanic complications have made that he was unable to explain i remind you of this species of evidence in which the witnesses have resorted to the most speculative reasoning and put forward the barest possibilities without the shadow of foundation but this i undertake to assert that there is not a single case to which they have spoken from their experience or as the result of their own knowledge on which there were the formidable and decisive symptoms of marked tetanus which existed in this case having gone through these three sets of diseases general convulsions arachnitis epilepsy proper and epilepsy with satanic complications i suppose we have pretty nearly exhausted the whole of these scientific theories but we are destined to have another and that assumed the formidable name of angina pectoris it must have struck you when my learned friend opened his case that he never ventured to assert the nature of the disease to which they referred the death of cook and it strikes me as most remarkable that no less than four distinct and separate theories are set up by the witnesses who have been called general convulsions arachnitis epilepsy with tetanic complications and lastly angina pectoris my learned friend had this advantage in not stating to you what his medical witnesses would set up because i admit that one after another they took me by surprise the gentleman who was called yesterday and who talked of angina pectoris would not have escaped so easily if i had been in possession of the books to which he referred 
for i should have been able to expose the ignorance the presumption of the assertions he dared to make i say ignorance and presumption and what is worse an intention to deceive i assert it in the face of the whole medical profession and i am sure i can prove it these medical witnesses one and all differ in the views they take on the subject but there is a remarkable coincidence between the views of some of them and the views of those who have been examined on the other side dr partridge dr robinson and dr letherby the most eminent of the witnesses whom my learned friend has called agreed with the statements of dr brodie and other witnesses that in the whole of their experience and the whole range of their learning and observations they know of no known disease to which the symptoms in cook's case can be referred when such men as these agree upon any point it is impossible to exaggerate its importance if it be the fact that there is no known disease which can account for such symptoms as those in cook's case and that they are referable to poison alone can you have any doubt that that poison was strychnia the symptoms at all events from the time the paroxysm set in are precisely the same distinctions are sought to be made by the sophistry of the witnesses for the defence between some of the antecedent symptoms and some of the others i think i shall show you that these distinctions are imaginary and that there is no foundation for them i think i may say that the witnesses called for the defence admit this that from the time the paroxysm set in of which cook died until the time of his death the symptoms are precisely similar to that of tetanus by strychnine but then they say and this is worthy of most particular attention there are points of difference which have led them to the conclusion that these symptoms could not have resulted from strychnine in the first place they say that the period which elapsed between the supposed administration of the poison and the first appearance of the symptoms is longer than they have observed in the animals on which they have experimented the first observation which arises is this that there is a known difference between animal and human life in the power with which certain specific things act upon their organization it may well be that poison administered to a rabbit will produce its effect in a given time it by no means follows that it will produce the same effect in the same time on an animal of a different description still less does it follow that it will exercise its baneful influence in the same time on a human subject the whole of the evidence on both sides leads to establish this fact that not only in individuals of different species but between individuals of the same species the same poison and the same influence will produce effects different in degree different in duration different in power but again it is perfectly notorious that the rapidity with which the poison begins to work depends mainly upon the mode of its administration if it is administered in a fluid state it acts with greater rapidity if it is given in a solid state its effects come on more slowly if it is given in an indurated substance it will act with still greater tardiness then what was the period at which this poison began to act after its administration assuming it to have been poison it seems from mr jones's statement that the pills were administered somewhere about eleven o'clock they were not administered on his first arrival for the patient as if with an intuitive sense of the death that awaited him strongly resisted the attempts to make him take them and no doubt these remonstrances and the endeavours to overcome them occupied some period of time the pills were at last given assuming which i only do for the sake of argument that the pills contained strychnine how soon did they begin to operate mr jones says he went down to supper and came back again about twelve o'clock upon his return to the room after a word or two of conversation with cook he proceeded to undress and go to bed and had not been in bed ten minutes before a warning came that another of the paroxysms was to take place the maid-servant puts it still earlier and it appears that so early as ten minutes before twelve the first alarm was given which would make the interval little more than a quarter of an hour when these witnesses tell us that it would take an hour and a half or two hours we see here another of those exaggerated determinations to see the facts only in the way that will be the most favourable to the prisoner 
i find in some of the experiments that have been made that the duration of time before the poison begins to work has been little if anything less than an hour in the case of the girl at glasgow it was stated it was three quarters of an hour before the pills began to work there may have been some reason for the pills not taking effect within a certain period after their administration it would be easy to mix them up with substances difficult of solution or which might retard their action i cannot bring myself to believe that if in all other respects you are perfectly satisfied that the symptoms the consequences the effect were analogous and similar in all respects to those produced by strychnine it is not because the pills have been taken only a quarter of an hour that you will say that strychnine was not administered in this case but they say the premonitory symptoms were wanting and they say that in the case of animals the animal at first manifests some uneasiness shrinks and draws itself into itself as it were and avoids moving that certain involuntary twitchings about the head come on and they say there were no premonitory symptoms in cook's case i utterly deny the proposition i say there were premonitory symptoms of the most marked character he is lying in his bed he suddenly starts up in an agony of alarm what made him do that was there nothing premonitory nothing that warned him the paroxysm was coming on he jumps up says go and fetch palmer fetch me help i am going to be ill as i was last night what was that but a knowledge that the symptoms of the previous night were returning and a warning of what he might expect unless some relief were obtained he sits up and prays to have his neck rubbed what was the feeling about his neck but a premonitory symptom which was to precede the paroxysms which were to supervene he begs to have his neck rubbed and that gives him some comfort but here they say this could not have been tetanus from strychnia because animals cannot bear to be touched for a touch brings on a paroxysm not only a touch but a breath of air a sound a word a movement of any one near will bring on a return of the paroxysm now in two cases of death from strychnine we have shown that the patient has endured the rubbing of his limbs and received satisfaction from that rubbing we produced a third case in mrs smith's case where her legs were distorted she prayed and entreated that she might have them straightened the lady at leeds in the case which dr nunnally himself attended implored her husband between the spasms to rub her legs and arms in order to overcome the rigidity that case was within his own knowledge and yet in spite of it although he detected strychnine in the body of the unhappy woman he dares to say that cook's having tolerated the rubbing between the paroxysms is a proof that he had not taken strychnia but there is a third case the case of clutterbuck he had taken an overdose of strychnia and suffered from the reappearance of tetanus and his only comfort was to have his legs rubbed and therefore i say that the continued endeavour to persuade a jury that the fact of cook's having had his neck rubbed proves that this is not tetanus by strychnia shows nothing but the dishonesty and insincerity of the witnesses who have so dared to pervert the facts but they go further and say that cook was able to swallow so he was before the paroxysms came on but nobody has ever pretended that he could swallow afterwards he swallowed the pills and what is very curious and illustrates part of the theory is this that it was the act of swallowing the pills a sort of movement in raising his head which brought on the violent paroxysm in which he died so far from mitigating against the supposition that this was a case of strychnine the fact strongly confirms it then they call our attention to the appearance after death and they say there are circumstances to be found which militate against this being a case of strychnine they say the limbs became rigid either at the time of death or immediately after and that ought not to be found in a case of strychnia dr nunnally says i have always found the limbs of animals become flaccid before death and have not found them become rigid after death now i can hardly believe that statement the very next witness who got into the box told us that he had made two experiments upon cats and killed them both 
and he described them as indurated and contracted when he found them some hours after death and yet the presence of rigidity in the body immediately after death is put forth by dr nunnally as one of his reasons for saying this is not a death by strychnia although dr taylor told us that in the case of one of the cats the rigidity of the body was so great that he could hold it out by the leg in a horizontal position notwithstanding that evidence dr nunnally has the audacity to say that he does not believe this is a case of strychnine because there was rigidity of the limbs because the feet were distorted and the hands clinched and the muscles rigid this shows what you are to think of the honesty of this sort of evidence in which facts are selected because they make in favour of particular hypotheses of the party advancing them the next thing that is said is that the heart was empty and that in animals operated upon by dr nunnally and dr letherby the heart was full i don't think that applies to all cases but it is a remarkable fact connected with the history of the poison that you never can rely upon the precise form of its symptoms and appearances there are only certain great leading marked characteristic features we have here the main marked leading characteristic features and we have what is more collateral incidents similar to the cases in which the administration and the fact of death have been proved beyond all possibility of dispute why in two cases which have been mentioned that of mrs smith and the glasgow girl the heart was congested and empty we know that in cases of tetanus death may result from more than one cause all the muscles of the body are subject to the exciting action of the poison but no one can tell in what order these muscles may be affected or where the poisonous influence will put forth when it arrests the play of the lungs and the breathing of the atmospheric air the result will be the heart is full but if some spasm seizes on the heart the heart will be empty you have never any perfect certainty as to the mode in which the symptoms will exhibit themselves but this is brought forward as a conclusive fact against death by strychnine and yet these men who make this statement under the sanction of scientific authority have heard both cases spoken to by the gentlemen who examined the bodies then with regard to congestion of the brain and other vessels the same observation applies instead of being killed by action on the respiratory muscles of the heart death is the result of a long series of paroxysms and you expect to find the brain and other vessels congested by that series of convulsive spasms as death takes place from one or other of these causes so will the appearances be there is every reason to believe that the symptoms in this case were symptoms of tetanus in the strongest and most aggravated form looking at the symptoms which attended this unhappy man setting aside the theory of convulsions of epilepsy of arachnitis and angina pectoris and excluding idiopathic and traumatic tetanus what remains the tetanus of strychnine and the tetanus of strychnine alone and i pray your attention to the cases in which there was no question as to strychnine having been administered in which the symptoms were so similar the symptoms so analogous that i think you cannot hesitate to come to the conclusion that this death was death by strychnine several witnesses of the highest eminence both on the part of the crown and for the defence agree that in the whole range of their experience observation and knowledge they have known of no natural disease to which these remarkable symptoms can be attributed that being so and there being a known poison which will produce them how strong how cogent how irresistible is the conclusion that it is that poison and that poison alone to which they are to be attributed on the other hand the case is not without its difficulties strychnia was not found in this body and we have it no doubt upon strong evidence that in a great variety of experiments upon the bodies of animals killed by strychnia strychnia has been detected by tests which science placed at the disposal of scientific men if strychnia had been found of course there would have been no difficulty in the case and we should have had none of the ingenious theories which medical gentlemen have been called here to propound the question for your consideration is 
whether the absence of its detection leads conclusively to the view that this death was not caused by the administration of strychnia now in the first place under what circumstances was the examination made by dr taylor and dr rees they told us that the stomach of the man was brought to them for analysation under the most unfavourable circumstances they state that the contents of the stomach had been lost and therefore they had no opportunity of experimenting upon them it is true that they who put the portions of the body into the jar make statements somewhat different but there appears to have been by accident some spilling of the contents and there is the most undeniable evidence of considerable bungling in the way in which the stomach had been cut and placed in the jar it was cut says dr taylor from end to end and it was tied up at both ends it had been turned among the intestines and placed amongst a mass of feculent matter and was in the most unsatisfactory condition for analysation it is very true that dr nunnally mr herapath and dr sotheby say that whatever impurities there may have been if strychnia had been in the stomach they would have found strychnia there i should have had every confidence in the testimony of dr herapath if he had not confessed a fact which had come to my knowledge that he had asserted that this was a case of poisoning but that they did not go the right way to find it out i reverence the man who from a sense of justice and love of truth will come forward in favour of any man for the purpose of stating what he believes to be true but i abhor the trafficked testimony which i regret to see men of science sometimes advance but assuming all they say to be true as to the case of detecting strychnine is it certain that it can be found in all cases dr taylor says no and it would be a most mischievous and dangerous proposition to assert that it is necessarily so for it enables many a guilty man to escape who by administering the smallest quantity necessary to destroy life might prevent its detection in the stomach what have these gentlemen done they have given large doses in the experiments they have made for the purposes of this case in which they have been retained i use the word retained for it is the proper word in all these cases i say they have given doses large enough to be detected but the gentleman who made the experiments in cook's case failed in detecting strychnine in two cases out of four in which they had administered it to animals the conclusion i draw is that there is no positive mode of detection but this case does not rest here alas i wish it did i must now draw your attention to one part of the case which has not been met or attempted to be disputed in the slightest degree by my learned friend my learned friend said that he would contest the case for the prosecution step by step alas we are now upon ground upon which any friend has not even ventured a word in explanation was the prisoner at the bar possessed of the poison of strychnia this is a matter with which it behoved my learned friend to deal and to exhaust all the means in his power in order to meet this part of the case the prisoner obtained possession of strychnia on the monday night it is true that the evidence of the man who sold the strychnia to palmer as i stated at the outset of these proceedings and i repeat it now must be received with care and attention now newton said that on the night when palmer came back from london he came to him and obtained three grains of that poison the symptoms and effects of which are precisely similar to those which are stated to have occurred in the case of this poor man with respect to the evidence of newton my learned friend has done no more than repeat the warning which i gave you at the commencement of the case you have heard the reason assigned by the witness why he did not state the fact of his having sold strychnine to the prisoner on the previous evening before the coroner and you will judge of the value of the explanation which he gave upon the other hand there is the consideration what conceivable motive could this young man have had for now coming forward and deposing to the fact of his having sold this poison to the prisoner except a sense of truth my learned friend has very justly and very properly asked for your most attentive consideration to the question of the motives involved in this part of the evidence 
before you can come to the conclusion of the prisoner having taken away with malice and forethought the life of another hideous though may be the crime of taking away life by poison it is probably not so horrible to contemplate as a motive of a judicial murder effected by a false witness against a man's life can you suppose that this young man newton could have the shadow of any such motive in coming forward in a court like this to take away the life of the prisoner at the bar as alas his evidence must do if you believe him if you believe the witness that on the monday night for no other conceivable and assignable purpose except the deed of darkness to be committed that night the prisoner at the bar obtained from him the fatal means and instrument whereby cook was to be destroyed it is impossible that you can come to any other conclusion that the prisoner is guilty of the foul deed with which he stands charged at the bar my learned friend says that newton did not speak truth because first he did not make this statement before the coroner and secondly because newton laid the time of palmer's arrival at nine o'clock whereas he did not arrive until ten o'clock now newton only stated that it was about nine o'clock and every one knows how easy it is to make a slight mistake as to the hour when there is nothing particular to fix the event on the memory my learned friend has sought to meet this part of the case he has produced a witness all i can say of whom is that for the sake of the prisoner at the bar i trust you will not allow him to be affected by anything which that most disreputable witness jeremiah smith has stated now dr bamford said that palmer told him he had himself seen cook between nine and ten o'clock while smith said that they did not leave the car until past ten o'clock with respect to the evidence of smith that he saw palmer alight from the car go from thence to the house of palmer's mother i ask you not to believe one single word of it because i do not myself believe a single word of his evidence certainly such a miserable spectacle as that witness in the box i have never been surpassed in a court of justice he is a member of the legal profession and i blush that such a member is to be found upon the rolls there was not one who heard his evidence who was not satisfied that the man came here to tell a falsehood not one who was not convinced that he was mixed up in many of the villainies which if not perpetrated were at all events contemplated and that he came here to save the life of his companion and friend and the son of the woman with whom he had that intimacy the nature of which he sought in vain to disguise i cannot but think that looking to the whole of this part of the case you must believe the evidence of newton and if you do so believe it then that evidence is conclusive of the case End of section twenty section twenty one of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson tenth day may the twenty fourth part three but the case does not stop there because we have the most indisputable evidence that on the following day palmer perched more strychnine at the shop of mr hawkins you remember the circumstance connected with that purchase palmer's first asking for some prussic acid and then ordering some strychnine to be put up for him newton coming in and the prisoner calling him out of the shop to speak to him of the most unimportant matters why did the prisoner take newton out of the shop evidently because he wished to avoid exciting suspicions that would very naturally be raised in the mind of newton from the fact of the prisoner having purchased strychnia on two occasions and who would very naturally inquire for what purpose it was that the prisoner wanted nine grains of strychnine why did the prisoner go to hawkins's shop to purchase the poison the reason was clear if he had gone to thirlby's who was his former assistant he would naturally have asked palmer for whom the strychnine was intended why the prisoner should have gone on two successive days and purchased the poison is one of those mysteries attending this case which i cannot explain at all events it is quite clear that he did so 
but if there is some difficulty in this part of the case there is on the other hand a still greater difficulty arising from the use to which the poison was to be put if it was for the purpose of professional use for the benefit of some patient where is the patient and why was he not produced my learned friend passed over this part of the case in mysterious but significant silence account for that six grains of strychnia throw a doubt if you please on the purchase of the strychnine on the monday night but on tuesday it is unquestionably true that six grains were purchased if these six grains were purchased for the use of any patients why were they not produced and if for any other purpose why was it not explained has there been the slightest shadow of attempt to show the use to which the poison was applied alas no something was said at the outset about dogs which were troublesome in the paddock to the prisoners mares and foals but that was proved to have been in september and if there had been any recurrence of this annoyance why was it not proved in evidence if it were used for the purpose of destroying dogs some one must have assisted him in the act why were they not called but not only were these persons not called they were not even named i ask you what conclusion you can draw from these circumstances except this one that the death of cook took place with all the symptoms of poison by strychnia death in all the convulsions and throes which that deadly poison produces in the frame of man it is said by my learned friend that palmer might easily have purchased strychnine at london and that he would not have purchased it in rugely on two occasions if he had intended to have used it for a criminal purpose i admit the fact and feel the full force of the observation and if he could have shown any proper use to which the poison was applied the assertion would have been one well worthy of your consideration but how do the facts stand with respect to palmer's visit to london he might it is true have purchased strychnine there but then on the occasion of his visit he had a great deal to do he had to catch the train he had pecuniary difficulties to settle and arrange and even then it would have required the certificate of one other person in order to have obtained the strychnine as he was not known in london as a medical practitioner but what avail all these suppositions when we have on the other hand the strong and unmistakable evidence that the prisoner did actually purchase the strychnine at rugeley well then it has been said that the fact of the prisoner having called in two medical men was strong presumptive evidence to negate his guilt it is true that he called in dr bamford and wrote to dr jones to come and see cook now as medical men it is true that they would be very likely to know the symptoms of death by strychnine but there is a point in this part of the case which deserves notice if these symptoms exhibited were not those resulting from strychnia but were referable to that multiform variety of diseases to which the witnesses have referred there is no reason why the prisoner should have any credit for sending for these medical gentlemen it is quite true that he called an old dr bamford i speak of that gentleman in no terms of disrespect but still i think i do him no injustice when i say that the vigour of his intellect and the powers of his mind have been impaired as all human powers are liable to be by the advance of age i do not think he was a person likely to make any very shrewd observation as to the cause of the death of cook and the best proof of this is to be found in what he did and what he wrote on the subject as regards mr jones these observations do not apply for he was a man in the possession of the full powers of mind the prisoner selected jones and the result proved how wise he was in making that selection the death of cook occurred in the presence of jones and all those painful symptoms you have heard described and yet jones suspected nothing and if the prisoner had succeeded in introducing cook's body into that strong oak coffin which he had made for him the body would have been consigned to the grave and nobody would have known anything of these proceedings while the presence of jones and dr bamford would have been used to prevent any suspicion on the other hand it is not at all improbable that the prisoner might have thought that the best mode of disarming all suspicions would be to take care that some medical men should be called in and should be present at the time of death there is nothing to show that the prisoner entertained the most distant notion that jones would have to sleep in the same room as cook 
and if this had not been the case they would have found in the morning that cook had gone through his mortal struggle and had died there alone and unfriended cook would have been found dead next morning and the old man would have said he died of apoplexy and the young man that he died of epilepsy and had any suspicion been awakened it would have been urged in reply as it has been by my learned friend that two medical men were called in by the prisoner previous to his death but the case does not end there we have had a great many witnesses who have told us a great deal about strychnia but none that have said a word about antimony on the wednesday night at shrewsbury when cook drank a glass of brandy and water he said that there was something in it which burned his throat and was afterwards seized with vomiting which lasted for several hours on the same night mrs brooke saw the prisoner shaking something in a glass it is a remarkable fact that when cook drank that brandy and water he was taken ill a few minutes after there were it is true other persons taken ill at shrewsbury about the same time but still you will have to bear in mind that scene of the shaking up of the fluid in the glass in the passage the fact that cook was somewhat in liquor and that in that state he ought not to have been told by the prisoner that he would not drink any more unless he finished his glass pass on however to rugeley you will still find that cook was under the influence of the same symptoms as those which he suffered at shrewsbury you have the fact of the prisoner sending him over toast and water and broth and that no sooner had the poor man taken these things than he is seized with incessant vomitings of the most painful character then too there was the broth said to have been sent by smith from the albion which was sent however not to the talbot inn but to the prisoner's kitchen this broth was taken over to the talbot by the prisoner himself and as soon as it was touched by cook vomitings followed there is too the fact that the servant at the talbot after taking two spoonfuls of the broth was ill for several hours and vomited something like twenty times then again on the monday when the prisoner was absent cook was found to be better but upon the tuesday when he returned to rugeley the vomitings again returned now the important fact is that antimony was found in the tissues of the poor man's body and in his blood and the presence of the antimony in the blood shows that it must have been taken within the last forty-eight hours before death the small quantity found does not afford however the slightest criterion of the whole quantity administered a part of the quantity given would have been thrown up in the vomiting something has been said about cook having taken the antimony in james's powder but not a little of evidence has been given that he took any of these powders while the presence of the antimony in the blood proved that it had been administered within forty-eight hours of death i believe that you will feel that you have a right to conclude from all the evidence that has been brought before you upon this point that antimony had been administered to cook in a mode and in quantities which showed that it could have been given for no legitimate object and further that it must have been administered by the prisoner and from these facts you will see how great is the probability that he must in that case have acted with a view of carrying out a fatal resolution previously formed for it is well known that antimony has often been given in amounts capable of destroying life but let us take into consideration the conduct of the prisoner in the after stages of the case and let us look at what took place on the day of cook's death on the preceding night he had suffered from what was indisputably a most severe attack dr bamford sees palmer on the tuesday morning and not a word is said to him about the attack the prisoner manifests an anxiety that he should not see the deceased he states that cook is quiet and is dozing and that he does not wish to have him disturbed that might be but on the other hand it must be remembered that if dr bamford had seen cook in the morning cook would in all probability have made known to him his frightful suffering of the night before and they must then have formed the subject which was of all others the most present to his memory dr bamford however did not see the deceased until seven o'clock on the tuesday evening when he was much better palmer had then talked of his having suffered from a bilious affection and it is a remarkable fact that he had more than once represented the illness of cook as one arising from a bilious attack both to dr bamford and dr jones although the patient had exhibited none of the symptoms which ordinarily accompany a bilious constitution 
The moment Dr. Jones saw him, he made the observation that his tongue was not that of a bilious patient. And the answer he got from Palmer was, Oh, you should have seen him before. Seen him when before? There was not the slightest ground for supposing that he had been suffering from any bilious complaint, either at Shrewsbury or since his arrival at Rugeley. But not one word did Palmer say to Dr. Jones about the fit of Cook on the night before. Well, the three medical men consulted together by the bedside of the patient, and then Cook turned round and said, Mind, I will have no more pills and medicine tonight, remembering, as he no doubt did at the time, his illness of the preceding night. No observation was made even then by Palmer as to what had been the nature of Cook's attack on the night before, but the medical men having withdrawn to the adjoining room or lobby, Palmer immediately proposed that Cook should again take the same pills he had taken on the previous night, but he desired Jones not to say anything to him about what they contained, lest he might object to take them. It was then arranged that the pills should be made up, and Palmer proposed that they should be compounded by Dr. Bamford, although it was then early in the evening, and he might easily have prepared them on his own premises. He accompanied Dr. Bamford to the surgery of the latter, and after the pills had been made up there, he asked Dr. Bamford to write the address on them, and the address was so written. An interval occurred of an hour or two, during which the prisoner had abundant opportunities of going to his surgery, and doing what he pleased in the way of changing the pills. He returned to the hotel, and before he gave the pills to Cook, he took care to call the attention of Jones, who was present at the time, to the remarkable handwriting of an old gentleman like Dr. Bamford, by whom the direction of the medicine had been written. What necessity was there for that? Might it not have been part of a preconceived design to save himself from any subsequent suspicion, by his being able to state that the pills had been prepared by Dr. Bamford? And might it not have been done for the purpose of disarming any immediate suspicion on the part of Dr. Jones himself? Have we not every reason to suppose that it may have been effectual in accomplishing the latter result? Any one of these circumstances could not have been of so decisive a character as to lead you to the conviction of the prisoner's guilt, but I ask you to consider them as a series of events following one another in close succession, and then I leave it to you to draw from them the conclusion to which you may find they must legitimately lead. I will now pass over for a moment the remainder of the history of the Tuesday night, and I will take you to the circumstances which immediately followed Cook's death. On the Thursday, Mr. Stevens, the stepfather of the deceased, went over to Rugeley on receiving intelligence of the sad event. He applied to Palmer for information upon the subject of Cook's affairs, and in the course of the communications which passed between them, Stevens said, rich or poor, the poor fellow should be buried. Palmer then observed that he would undertake to bury him himself, but Mr. Stevens declined, in a decisive manner, to avail himself of that offer. I admit that there may be nothing suspicious in the proposal of Palmer to bury his friend, if it should be taken by itself, but there is this somewhat remarkable circumstance on this part of the case, that when Mr. Stevens had said that he could not have the funeral for a few days, Palmer observed that the body ought to be put in a coffin immediately. And when, after an absence of about half an hour, he returned, and was asked by Mr. Stevens for the name of an undertaker to whom he should give directions about the funeral, the prisoner stated, much to the surprise of the gentleman whom he was addressing, that he had himself ordered a shell and a strong oak coffin. Why should he have so hurriedly interfered in the business of another man, unless he made up his mind that the body should be consigned to its last resting place, and removed from the sight of man with the utmost possible rapidity? You have heard the conversation which took place between Mr. Stevens and the prisoner on the Saturday at the different railway stations at which they met. It appears that at that time Mr. Stevens had made up his mind that a post-mortem examination of the body of the deceased should take place, in consequence of circumstances which had engendered a suspicion in his mind that the death of his stepson had not been the result of natural disease. He had noticed the strange attitude of the deceased, 
his clinched hands and the unusual appearance of his face and being a man of natural shrewdness and sagacity he felt a lurking suspicion which he could not unravel that there must have been foul play in the case he made known to the prisoner his intention of having the body opened before it was consigned to the grave it is true that the prisoner did not flinch from that trying ordeal and that he met with firmness the trying gaze of mr stevens when the report of the post-mortem examination was first mentioned but finding that there was to be a post-mortem examination he was anxious to know who was to perform it mr stevens would not inform him but merely stated that it was to take place on the monday then we have on the sunday that remarkable conversation between the prisoner and newton which has been for some time known to the crown it is true that newton did not mention the conversation in the course of his examination before the coroner but the reason for this silence upon the subject on that occasion may be easily proved he was called at the inquest solely for the purpose of corroborating the evidence of roberts with respect to palmer's appearance in dr hawkins's shop on the tuesday morning and to that point his evidence before the coroner was confined he has since deposed that during a conversation with palmer on the sunday the latter suddenly asked him what quantity of strychnine would you give if you wanted to kill a dog the reply was from half a grain to a grain the prisoner then asked would you expect to find any traces of it in the stomach after death newton answered no and on his doing so he observed the prisoner make a movement conveying an intimation of his delight i had at one time thought that my learned friend engaged for the defence would have attempted to show that the prisoner had purchased the strychnia at the commencement of the week for the purpose of destroying dogs but no evidence whatever has been adduced to establish such a point and we have no evidence of any kind to show how that strychnia was applied but my learned friend has contended that the prisoner had no motive for taking away the life of his friend cook now if i convince you upon unimpeachable evidence that the death of cook had been caused by strychnine and that that strychnine could only have been administered by the prisoner then the question of motive must become a mere secondary consideration it is often difficult to give into the breast of man and to ascertain with any certainty the reasons which directed him to any particular course of action and the inscrutable character of any particular motive ought not to destroy the force of a well-authenticated fact but motive is unquestionably an important element in a case over which any doubt as to the facts can by any possibility rest i believe i can perfectly satisfy your minds that in this case the prisoner had a motive and a very obvious motive for taking away the life of cook he was at the time reduced to a condition of the direst embarrassment it appears that in the month of november last he owed on bills not less than nineteen thousand pounds of which twelve thousand five hundred pounds worth was in the hands of pratt and out of that latter sum five thousand five hundred pounds was pressing for immediate payment by the death of cook he was enabled to obtain possession of one thousand and twenty pounds due to the latter in the shape of bets he was enabled to obtain possession of the money which cook must have had about him on his arrival at rugeley and which according to one of the witnesses must have amounted to seven hundred pounds or eight hundred pounds and he attempted to obtain possession of the three hundred and fifty pounds which the messrs weatherby were to have received as the amount of the state of the shrewsbury handicap the order forwarded by palmer to messrs weatherby for the three hundred and fifty pounds and purporting to bear the signature of cook had been sent back by them to the prisoner and if that signature was not a forgery why had it not been produced on the part of the defendant my learned friend says that cook was the best friend of the prisoner and that cook was the only person to whom he could look for assistance in his embarrassments but cook had no means of assisting him unless he were to appropriate to his use the money which he had won at shrewsbury which was all the property he then possessed and can any one believe that the deceased would have parted with that money 
and would have left himself wholly without any resources for the approaching winter my learned friend contends that the fact that palmer had written the letter on the friday night in which he asked fisher to pay two hundred pounds to pratt on account of a transaction in which both he and palmer were interested while three hundred pounds more were to be sent upon that night my learned friend contends that that fact shows that the prisoner and the deceased perfectly understood one another at the time and goes far to prove the innocence of his client to my mind however that very circumstance affords a very strong argument in favour of the case for the crown the only transaction with pratt in which palmer and cook were both interested was that relating to the bill for five hundred pounds and in which cook had assigned his horse as a collateral security it is very easy to see that he must have felt particularly anxious that that claim should at once be settled and that his horses should come into his own undisputed possession one of these horses being a very valuable one namely polestar which had just won the shrewsbury race he accordingly i have no doubt gave palmer three hundred pounds to be sent up to london on account of that bill but that sum was never applied by the prisoner to the purpose for which it had been placed in his hands there is not the slightest foundation for the statement that cook had entered into an arrangement with palmer for the purpose of defrauding fisher of the two hundred pounds he had advanced for there was nothing in his character which could show that he was capable of so infamous an act and it could not possibly have been his interest that it should take place i will not ask you to direct your attention to the request addressed by the prisoner to cheshire the postmaster that he should bear his witness to the genuineness of cook's signature to the order on the messrs weatherby for the sum of three hundred and fifty pounds that request was made forty-eight hours after cook's death and if the signature was not a forgery why was that extraordinary demand made of cheshire and why had not the document been since produced it is impossible to forget that if cheshire had testified to the genuineness of that document the prisoner would have been enabled to exercise over him the most fatal control and that he might then have compelled him to sign another paper transferring as the prisoner had sought to do in the course of one of his conversations with mr stevens to the deceased the liability for four thousand pounds or five thousand pounds due on bills to pratt and outstanding in his own name all these facts show irrefragably as i contend that the death of cook had in the opinion of the prisoner become most desirable for his own relief there is another part of his conduct as tending to throw light on this matter and that is with reference to cook's betting book on the night when cook died ere the breath had hardly parted from that poor man's body the prisoner was found there rummaging his pockets and searching for his papers when subsequently stevens asked for the betting book the prisoner said oh it's of no use for a dead man's bets are void true it is that a dead man's bets are void but not when they are paid during his life who received the bets the prisoner at the bar who was answerable for them the prisoner at the bar who had an interest in concealing the amount of those debts the prisoner at the bar if stevens had seen that book he would have seen that cook was entitled to a sum of one thousand and twenty pounds he would have seen that fisher was his agent and from him that herring and not fisher had calculated his bets but there is still more yet to be accounted for when stevens determined upon having a post-mortem examination what was the conduct of the prisoner at the bar the learned attorney-general then proceeded to refer to the arrival of dr harland in the town of rugeley for the purpose of making the examination his conversation with palmer when the latter said that cook had died of epileptic fits and that traces of old disease would be found in the head and heart none of which were however found on the examination of the body the removal of the jar containing the stomach and intestines of cook the slits cut in the covering probably for the purpose of introducing something into the jar which would neutralize the poison if it were present the restlessness and uneasiness of the prisoner while the examination was going on his remonstrating with dr bamford for letting the jars be sent away 
and his attempt to bribe the postboy to upset the chaise and break the jar the conduct of mr stevens the stepfather of cook in resolving to prosecute this inquiry was such as the gravity and importance of the case proved ought to have protected him from the charge of insolent curiosity brought against him by my learned friend the honourable and learned gentleman then concluded as follows it is for you to say under these circumstances whether or not the death of the deceased was caused by the prisoner at the bar you have indeed had introduced into this case one other element which i cannot help thinking might well have been omitted you have heard from my learned friend an unusual i think i may even say an unprecedented expression of the innocence of his client i can only say on that point that i believe my learned friend might have abstained from any such statement what should he think of me if imitating his example i should at this moment declare to you on my honour as he did what is the internal conviction which has followed from my conscientious consideration of this case my learned friend has with a full display of his great ability also adopted another course which although sometimes resorted to by members of our profession involves in my mind a species of insult to the good sense and the good feeling of the jury my learned friend told you that if your verdict in this case should be guilty the innocence of the prisoner will one day or other be made manifest and you would never cease to regret the verdict you have given if my learned friend was sincere in that and i know that he was for there is no man who is more alive than he is to the claims of truth and honour but if he said what he believed all i can state in answer is that i can only attribute the conviction he has expressed to that strong bias which his mind easily perhaps received in directing all his energies to the defence of a man charged with this frightful crime but i still think he would have done well to have abstained from any assurance of the innocence of the prisoner at the bar i go further and say that i think he ought in justice and in consideration to you to have abstained from telling you that the voice of the country would not sanction the verdict which you might give i say nothing of the inconsistency which is involved in such a statement coming from one who but a short time before complained in eloquent terms of the universal torrent of passion and of prejudice by which he said his client was borne down in answer to my learned friend i have only this to say to you pay no regard to the voice of the country whether it be for condemnation or for acquittal pay no regard to anything but the internal voice of your own consciences trust to the sense of that duty to god and man which you are about to discharge upon this occasion seeking no reward except the comforting assurance that when you shall look back at the events of this trial you have discharged to the best of your ability and to the utmost of your power the duty you have been called upon to fulfil if on a review of the whole case comparing the evidence on one side and on the other and weighing it in the even scales of justice you can come to the conclusion of innocence or even entertain that fair and reasonable doubt of guilt of which the accused is entitled to the benefit in god's name give to him that benefit but if on the other hand all the facts and all the evidence lead your minds with satisfaction to yourselves to the conclusion of his guilt then but only then i ask for a verdict of guilty at your hands for the protection of the good for the repression of the wicked i then ask for that verdict by which alone as it seems to me the safety of society can be secured and the demands the imperious demands of public justice can be satisfied the honourable and learned gentleman concluded his address shortly after half-past six o'clock after having occupied the breathless attention of every one who had heard him during a period of three hours and three quarters lord campbell then addressed the jury as follows the cause of public justice imperatively requires that the court should now adjourn i shall feel it my duty in this important case to bring before you the whole of the evidence on the one side and on the other accompanying the reading of it with such remarks as i may think it proper to make it is impossible to enter on that duty at this hour and i am therefore under the painful necessity of ordering that you be again kept sequestered 
from your families and friends during another sabbath the court then adjourned at twenty-five minutes to seven o'clock until ten o'clock on monday we may here observe that the prisoner listened with deep attention to the whole of the address of the attorney-general and even with an air of considerable anxiety although he still preserved his usual perfect self-possession. End of section 21